Hello, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Dave Vellante was here last week. We're getting up and running in our East Coast super studio, super pop access point to the Cube network, of course, bringing you wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Cube style. I'm here with Carmen Lee, who's the founder and CEO of Silicon Data. Great name, I love the word silicon in it, silicon angle, of course, team loves the word silicon. We love silicon chips, we love silicon innovation, compute, GPUs, XPUs, chips. Same here, we right. love everything silicon based too. <laughs> okay. Congratulations and thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, this is very exciting. Okay, so let's, before we get into some of the uh, meaty conscious around silicon and what's going on there, explain what silicon data does. What was the inspiration, the founding story, and what you guys do? Yeah, so we are very new. We started April this year, so we're six months old, so be kind to us. Um, the, really, the inspiration is from when we see the whole rush to open AI, to gen AI use cases. And from my point of view, which is pretty much financial services, financial infrastructure, I see a big lack on financial product development, data product development point of view. If you think about in a world where translate compute, well, we're talking about compute here, right? But that translate compute to another asset class as, as a resource, just like mm -hmm. electricity, just like cool oil energies and natural gas, then you realize that the big difference in those two markets is everything else I mentioned, electricity, cool oil, natural gas, they are very mature. They has a vast suite of financial products, data products to get investors, the, um, the, the, the users for price fluctuation, for use cases, transparencies with data. And then you look at compute, which is growing so fast. In a few years, I really believe that it will overtake any other energy market and there's really not enough financial products, data products to guide the users, give transparency, efficiency to the markets. That's what we people really so need. So a bold vision, you're ahead of the curve, you're seeing a financial market, is that right, around a the dynamics? A financial infrastructure and data markets, yes. And what would that look like? I mean, uh, trading, GPUs, um, um, some said GPUs are like gold, <laughs> I mean, and you can't get enough of them, they're on allocation with Blackwell, with NVIDIA. I, I really think, essentially, I think, I, I believe, find any financial products and data products really to provide the, the industry with a mechanism to transfer risks to manage risks and then give people the transparency what's 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 the what kind of volatility and what kind of risk exposure they have to help people manage their portfolio and assets and then really predict for the future right so you if you put that last down I really think it should be mature financial products we can talk about derivative products talk about other you know OTC products and data products think about the market prices start with that and any other sort of benchmarking carbon we just talk about it energy yeah. anything related to compute as an underlying asset class who's the target audience for your products great question there are three major cohort people who express interest the number one will be the actual the the, the, the people who use compute if you think about data center owners they own compute resources Sources, uh, essentially, and people actually use compute, so any technology company, any large corporation. Yeah. Everyone is doubling down the whole AI workflow. That's the one sector. And the second sector are the financial services firms. You think about bank, you need to underwrite a huge data center uh, mm. uh, financing. How are they going to manage their risk portfolio? How are they going to benchmark it? Yeah. The revenue, forecasting, right? All the financial institution needs a product to help them manage risks, predict future cash flows, and then market makers. Yeah. Carmen, it's a really interesting because what you're bringing in is asset allocation with compute. And as enterprise AI just kind of gets going, I mean, IBM quoted McKinsey saying only 1% of the enterprises are tapping into generative AI. You're going to probably see the leverage of assets and workflows and pricing that in. I mean, what, I mean. So like, my, my goal is to make the market as healthy, can develop as efficiently as, I mean, at least that's my personal goal, right? I think <laughs> I really believe in transparent market will help industry, help everybody, help data center people, help people in the, you know, in the technology space and help people in, so every day, do you and me kind of lower cost of any products we access to? You know, when you have a bold vision like you do and you see something early, and I want to get into what you saw early, um, there's always people who misun misunderstand it. And, and my favorite quote was from Andy Jassy, now CEO of Amazon. He said for a long time, AWS was misunderstood. And he said to be a really good entrepreneur when you're early is to tolerate being misunderstood, which is people don't get it. Most people, oh, we have to change the marketing. No, that's a good thing. It's actually a feature, not a bug. Right. So how, what are people responding to? 
do people understand and the people who don't understand or misunderstanding what you're doing, how do you respond to that? And what would you say to kind of, if you had to clarify that? Right, I think a lot of, um, obviously my, I'm, I'm not a consumer product. Yeah. I have a lot less um, target client base than AWS. Yeah. So my product is so niche where, you know, if you're looking at, you can use my different product, different doing use cases. If you look at someone, if you are the um, center of excellence for a big corporation, you look at ROI for any of AI investment. For you, okay, think about the cost. How much I'm paying for all the GPU, for the training, yeah. for the rack. That's one component, you probably need some data yeah. exposure. Or you just try to figure out, okay, this is one workflow I can put in 20 different data centers I currently have, or I can utilize one of those hyperscalers. Which one should I really do? Should I factor carbon yeah. as part of the calculation for the cost? As say, same chips, different data center, different carbon footprint. Different electricity price, which they probably know, but also different carbon footprint depends on the energy sources. Yeah. So all those things factor in. So obviously they're, they're probably not gonna, you know, in the future train my products. However, they can use the data yeah. product to guide their decisions. So you're saying that if I have to make a decision on a major system overhaul, which they're doing with AI systems like NVIDIA and others, that they have to look at the power envelope and factor that into the calculation if you want a completely holistic picture, I would encourage them at least to do the calculation, and you can take the next steps. So actually, my, my, I hate to do the plug, but my, both my products are launching this Friday, which is quite exciting, and it's beta launch. We want to give people the access and the transparency. It's what, what Let's I'm get to about. the product. So what do you have right now? What are some of the current things you have on the table now? There's two products um, we're releasing this Friday. One called Silicon Navigator. I know you love the name. The second, the second product is Silicon Carbon. Silicon Navigator, think about a giant market price for all the major 50 chips, um, GPU chips um, available in the markets, both retail prices, meaning if you buy them all yep. from the market, how much you're paying them. The second is the rental prices. Let's say if you make a decision between purchase versus rent, and then you can do your own calculation. How, how many hours are you going to do that for? 100,000 yeah. hours, should I buy it, should I purchase it, or should I rent it, yeah. right? And the second is a carbon, where you can put in which chip you want to use, where data center is, you don't have to tell me, you just put in a zip code, or choose one from Hyperscaler, which you probably know which one you're, yeah. you're with, and tell me how many hours you're thinking about using it. Well, I'll tell you how much carbon footprint we can, based on the estimation we have, we'll give the exact calculation, every single input, and you can tell me if data is wrong, we have to take feedback as well. Are the sustainability mandates factoring in now into this, is that important? Obviously, you've been interested three times. Sounds like that carbon footprint calculation is super important. I think, I would like to think it's important. Uh, I'm not going to tell people what to do. They can they can do a carbon trade, they can offset in whatever they really want. They can just generate a lot of, you know, green energy bump. Back. Well, they have goals too, right? They they have, don't they have their f carbon goals, sustainability yes. goals? That's what, I think that's probably the reason, that's my guess. People started working back, you, you hear less yeah, yeah. about those talks. But the one thing I want to make sure is, number one, you have the data, and number two, you can figure out strategy, yeah. how to tackle that. Not to change the subject, but I've been hearing a lot of um, arbitrage going on in GPUs, a lot of people, chips being sold in different markets, gray markets, black markets. So there's kind of an underbelly arbitrage going on. Does that factor into anything, or is that just market that you deal with? or? Or is that not an issue? Um, well, I don't think it's not an issue. So if you look at um, compute, right, compared again to any other virtual markets, you will see, you know, markets where you know it's gray or mm -hmm. it's it's problematic and regulation needs to step in. But the way I look at it is, okay, let's say you have one, let's say one H100 cluster. They actually price very differently in France versus in Singapore versus in you know Dubai, different chips, but in Middle East somewhere. Yeah. Right? And there's a reason for that. Do you want to ship your data over to train the model? Or do you want to just be, hey, I'm fine with US East? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So availability is an issue. So yeah, and then obviously people, they buy and sell clusters. But however, if you think about NVIDIA, the way they um, service their, uh, their, their clusters, and it's mm -hmm. also a component of consideration. Yeah, risk management comes up a lot. Governance is going to be a big part of the data and how this all factored in. What was the generation of the idea? What was the genesis? Did you wake up one day, you've just been itching at this problem, you saw an opportunity, you know, as the, you saw they rec recognize the opportunity. Take me through that process. Yes, um, it's actually very intuitive to me and I'm sure to a lot of people out there as well is um, I'm come from a very traditional background, financial services. I started my career off as a high frequency trader at DLW Trading. Uh, so we create trading platform systems for energies and fixed incomes yeah. and, you know, uh, uh, index teams. 
And then I realized that you know this is a market give a lot of transparency, efficiency, and people can get in and out position very quickly, very cheaply. Yeah. Uh, everybody knows about the price, which is I think is more market really needs. Then I take a look at the compute markets. When I hear complaints yeah. from a lot of AI yeah, company I was working with, yeah. and the complaint is, hey, um, you know it's great SaaS model I have. However, my spot prices of compute is all over the place. For a dollar today, six dollar tomorrow, and there's no way I can control that. Yeah. And in my mind, I was like, that doesn't make sense. This yeah. doesn't sound like a sustainable business model for anyone. If American Airlines can hatch their oil prices, yeah. I mean, how can you run business with that? So that's sort of very intuitive to me. Yeah. Hey, the market is so underdeveloped, yeah. and someone needs to step in yeah. to create a financial products and as well as data products to serve that particular yeah. cohort. I mean, the changing in prices, one, it's a reality in every business, and two, the hedging is interesting. So now you can build the hedge to maybe potentially offset risk costs. transfer again, risk transfer, right? You don't want the risk somewhere else. They want to speculate on that. That's great that I'm taking the risks for business people. You just want a stable cost. You know exactly going to cost three dollars per hour. Fantastic. Yeah. You don't want to go up and down, right? But you don't want to get into like say five year contract, yeah. right? Or you can a week you get out, just like every single other futures market. It could be a nice revenue stream too to offset those costs. Exactly. I'll predict the future. Predict yeah. your revenue expectation. And you got well. data. Yes. So you have. So again, if you're if you're a big bank and you have a huge, say you're Goldman and you have all these, you know, cloud and Capital One is huge on the cloud, they want to start thinking about training their data. I'm sure they have projects. There's no TCO calculator, right? <laughs> I mean, remember the old TCO calculator? You, exactly. You type in all those calculators. Oh, give, give you a comfort. Spits out a like, number. How much? Yeah. You're kind of going down that road to yeah. do some asset planning with commodity. Compute basically. I like to give them transparency what's happening in the past, what's happening now, and then we can all talk about what's going to happen in the future. Again, demand supply, right? All I want to do is give you the transparency that show them the demand supply curve. Okay, so you're you're newly formed. What's it been like so far? Give us a feeling for Amazing. who's you're talking to, customers you have, <laughs> yes. what's been the feedback, yes. any changes in product strategy. I'm chasing, but you know, I, literally my friends, my people I know, they chase after me. Basically <laughs> the client is like, I thought you are going to probably be out in like next month. So it's like, doesn't take, they don't need time to accumulate. Yeah. You have to verify and test. The model is built and tested. Um, but yes, and chase. You know, by my clients basically, which yeah. is which is awesome feeling. At the same time, you feel the urgency, yeah. the responsibility to create a product actually worked and track the market and produce a clean, great data. And no data can be you know without error. But I want to create as good as it can be. So, are you thinking syndication of the platform, or are you thinking custom products for specific companies, or both? Um, really, creating a standardized product. So for me, it's about what's really people need to expose, what, what kind of product people need can really help them manage our risks. So right now, we're focusing on the top thing, top GPU chips people are using most yeah. frequently. Obviously, we, we're not with third party, so we don't really take sides with which chips they want to use. Yeah, demand what is a company, big part of it. Exactly, what company, what kind of chip company they want to go with. For us, is what, what, what people you, what are people using. Yeah. If everybody's using one type of chip, that's what we're going to do. If people are using 20, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so the question is risk management dealing with the ever-changing GPU landscape or XPU landscape, Broadcom, NVIDIA, they're all building these new chip designs, um, memory, you know, right. um, HBA, HBA's hot, I mean, it's hard to get, but other memory is highly available. Right. So when, when people have to figure all this out, they have to factor in things like allocation. That's right. Are, are the chips available? Right. What's that going to impact on the risk? Take me through that, that kind of mindset because those are big determinations into deployment yes which has an operational risk yes i agree so if you think about so if you talk about new chips coming out the, the blackwell right obviously there's no data currently available so unfortunately i don't have any insights yeah right what i will have is a lot of data on the a100 the h100 the h200 mm -hmm. l4s the 490s so all the good stuff right mm -hmm. and then that's like the amdl but a lot of different chips yeah. um what we usually people come to me is they listen to people they were like hey i'm gonna invest x amount in this cluster, this data center, this yeah, yeah. location, how am I going to price this? Yeah. Right? So I'm pricing like near the hyperscaler or some secondary cloud provider, like what's the visibility? Mm -hmm. So, and then no H100 class is the same, yeah. essentially, different to your point, different CPU, different memory bandwidth. So what we do is we put bring all their specifications and then we calibrate to the market and it depends on where they are. We'll give them this is the range that it's market price. 
valuation, not, not cost-based, but market-based valuation. Again, it's their decision to see how when they want to price this yeah. in. The thing about um, that's interesting, I find, is, is that you've seen a lot of the, what DGX did with NVIDIA. That's right. You see Core, we, we mentioned that before yep. we came on camera. Um, you got these GPU clouds, you got these new services. Yes. I could buy yes. and sit on them, but oh, there's no power. <laughs> okay, oops. Yeah, right. yep, yep. Flaw in the design. Um, cooling. Yes. Are the constraints. Yep. So you have constraint issues, and then do I buy the product or I, do I? Pay by the drink. Right. Oh, rent it, depends yeah. which, where should you rent it from, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that sounds like you're hitting that too. So if I'm a customer, I can look at that and say, okay, I should be paying Core Weave. X amount. X amount. Mm -hmm. Right. So do they're formulating their pricing strategies or so, bid? Again, I'm not advising on price. I think everything depends on supply. If someone market. is so great, have the best knowledge software and support and everything else, I mean, you can argue they yeah. probably should charge high at a premium. Yeah. For someone, hey, it's some a data center, like a cluster in my basement from Carmen's home, you probably want not pound pay much <laughs> because it's not very, gonna be very reliable. <laughs> you won't right? make the market market price. It, exactly, right? So you have to time the risks, how much you can really yeah. tolerate. And it depends on workflow. Some workflow cannot be interrupted. Some need huge clusters. You yeah. might not want to risk that. If you're doing some quick inference Oh, you probably don't yeah. care about that. Ah, it's fine. She's charging me 40 cents. Who cares? I can see in my mind an infographic on siliconangle.com from Silicon Data, <laughs> powered by Silicon Data, current prices. We'd love know. to work with you on that. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to give exposure to, 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 uh, to them participants. Well, we hope that can happen soon. So if, if you look at the future, okay, your vision, what's your North Star vision? Take me through the steady, in, the, in your mind, you're at a steady state, you get the product out there, you got some new product additions, what does the future look like at a steady state for you? I don't know if ever been in a steady state. That's the thing, because things move so fast. Everyone is completely formal anxious. I don't know, maybe it's about all my friends. No. <laughs> it's so, things are moving so quickly with chips and you know all the large language model update every six months and chips coming out every, every year now, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's getting crazy. So the way I want to see it is the market grow at a pace where the financing can come in effectively. There's a lot yeah. of risk management too, and people have the transparency, have the yeah. trust. If you buy anything, let's say from a third party, you have the trust, say, hey, it's not like I hope it works. It's more like, hey, it's verified by Silicon Data. Yeah. Hopefully it works, yeah. right? So this is a third party sort of oversight. So you're, you're integrating, you're, you're at the nexus of financing and high performance compute. I would like to be from the a market, a marketplace data, perspective, yeah, exactly. a data provider yes. for that intersection. Correct. All right, what's next? You, you got some funding, <laughs> oh, you got yes. products. We, we, I got give really a, give, lucky give with a plug the for the company, what you're looking for. Obviously I'm hiring, um, I'm looking for amazing engineers and product and business people. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we're based in, in New York, however, we're pretty much open, be flexible, working from home policies. We love to hire amazing people from every discipline, and if you're an engineer or your data scientist person, we love to hire you. Um, and obviously the vision is really become the sort of a, information, data, product center, so we can really help the computer market to grow. So Carmen, I have to ask the entrepreneurial journey question because yes. you know it's hard to do startups. What's the journey been like for you personally? And I mean, share some experiences. <laughs> um, it's been amazing. I would literally tell my friends, I love every single day. Waking up so excited to do work. I really, because it's a problem for my team sometimes. Like, Carmen never sleeps and never stops. <laughs> and the only time I don't do work is when I'm with my kids. I have two daughters and seven, three. Um, so it's amazing to be a mother and at the same time be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm so happy every day. I, sp I do yeah. things absolutely I love, which is doing the work. I, yeah. I'm really passionate about this industry. The things yeah. I think I can help the industry to move quickly, effectively, efficiently. That's the most important Yeah, the industry thing. needs you. Well, we're certainly looking forward to collaborating. Thanks for coming on Thank here at the Cube. Thank you so much for inviting me. This we're is great. NYSC. This great is the view. center of all the finances. Yes. Our studio in Palo Alto connecting Wall Street with Silicon we're, Valley yeah. and creating a, a great community. And thanks for being part Thank of the this is, Cube this is awesome. and the NYSC wire community that Brian's uh, putting together. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, we are here, the Cube's East Coast location. Again, linking Silicon Valley and Wall Street together, merging the communities and building the network. It's an open source network. And uh, looking forward to more content. I'm John Furrier, their host. Thanks for watching.